How do I introduce today's movie? Um, play a clip. Blue. Pretty, isn't it? It's the color blue. Uh, this movie, Blue, by Derek Jarman, is quite literally nothing but the color blue. What? Watching this movie means staring at this blank field of a single shade of blue for an hour and 19 minutes. I've talked about weird stuff, obscure stuff, offensive stuff, but I don't think I've ever talked about something this experimental. I... We've hit peak weirdness. This barely, barely counts as a moving picture. And that's only because it has opening and closing credits. Okay, you're thinking, well that can't be all that happens. And you're right. There's also narration. You make him cry out, saying, Oh blue, come forth. Oh blue, arise. Oh blue, ascend. Oh blue, come in. Narration about the color blue. Well, it's pretty. Music's nice. Actor Nigel Terry's voice is really pretty. Even though he does say the word blue like he's slowly deflating. Blue. And he says blue a lot. Blue is even a character in the movie. Blue stretches, yawns, and is away. Blue goes on adventures. Marco Polo stumbles across the blue mountain. Blue gets into fights with other colors. Blue fights diseased yellow belly, whose fetid breath scorches the trees yellow with ague. And when he's tired, every other particular shade of him jumps out of its Crayola box and does his job for him. Belladonna, Delphinium, Cornflower, Ultramarine, Lapis, Cobalt, Indigo, Nature, Blue, 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 Blue. It's blue, get it? So, blue. This is the bluest blue that ever blued. It is the blue man group covered in blueberry pie under the light of a blue moon. It is a bluegrass musician eating blue cheese while using Bluetooth. It is little boy blue in blue velvet and blue suede shoes. It's a freaky interracial orgy with the Smurfs and the Navi. It's a blue Monday with Mr. Blue Sky shining on me as I'm tangled up in blue. It's blue y'all, it's blue y'all. It's bliggity blue, bluer than blue, it's blue y'all. It's blue dabu dee dabu die, dabu dee dabu die, dabu dee dabu die, dabu dee dabu die. I just blew myself. But here's the thing. You can't just dismiss this. Derek Jarman's film Blue has plenty of admirers. Hell, it's on permanent display at both the Tate Modern in London and the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Surely there must be something in Blue worth cleaning. What's in Blue besides Blue? Well, why not? Let's all just ponder this for a while. Let's all just overthink the color blue. Let's follow Blue's clues. So, um, Blue. What, what's Blue? What things are the color blue? I feel like a kindergarten teacher. So what things are the color blue? That's right, the sky. The sky is blue. What else is the color blue? That's right, the ocean. The ocean is also blue. Okay, just starting from there. Despite being the most popular color in the world, the color blue is quite rare in nature. 
a handful of birds, insects, flowers, a poisonous frog or two, and only a small number of natural elements could produce a blue hue. The indigo plant, made in India, was a provider of luxurious blue dye for millennia in the Old World, and became one of the main reasons Britain wanted to keep India and its indigo in the British Empire. And the even rarer semi-precious stone lapis lazuli, used throughout the ancient world, was often worth more than gold to artists and architects. But the bluest blue all humans are most familiar with is the sky and the sea, both things that one can't really touch. We still describe the unexpected and surprising as coming out of the blue. And so throughout the world, blue has strong religious ties. The blue and white tzitzit worn by Jews to remind them of the covenant, the azure skin of Vishnu's avatars Rama and Krishna, the king of lapis light by Sajaguru, known as the medicine Buddha, the many, many, many blue moss throughout the Islamic world, the turquoise skull mosaics that honor the gods of the Maya, the blue robe that covers the head of the Virgin Mary, all are attempts to connect with my blue heaven. This attempt to capture heaven has also made blue a sign of trust and authority. While expensive blue dyes made medieval European nobles blue-blooded, in the modern age, blue began to symbolize the power of the nation rather than nobility. In the age of nationalism, 53% of the world's flags contain the color blue. The uniforms of revolutionary France? Blue. Revolutionary America? Also blue. The Prussian army? Prussian blue. The flag of the United Nations? White on blue. Today, we're protected from crime by the thin blue line, from attacks at sea by navy blue, from the sky by air force blue, and from space by TARDIS blue. As blue dyes got cheaper, we all started wearing blue jeans and going to blue collar jobs when we weren't telling blue jokes till we were blue in the mouth. And in the modern age, blue doesn't just mean heaven, it means earth. To the Apollo astronauts, we live on the blue marble, and to Carl Sagan, the pale blue dot. We've never stopped loving blue. Even when ultramarine blue was the most expensive pigment in Europe, artists like Giotto and Titian used it to glorify the infinite beauty of the heavens. But in a more modern, more secular age of cheaper blues, we began to be plagued by blue devils. Artists looked into that infinite blue and despaired, feeling small in the vastness of it. With the brushes of Monet, Renoir, Gauguin, and Van Gogh, blue came to mean melancholy, setting the scene for Picasso's famous blue period. When that infinite heaven descended into night, blue became the perfect expression for all the anger, the frustration, the sadness, and the loneliness in our hard lives. And I guess that's why they call it the blue. But why do we call it blue? Actually, lots of people don't. They might have words for black, white, red, and yellow without having a separate distinct label for blue. And if they do have a word meaning blue, it might be mixed with what English speakers call green. If you speak Japanese, you can describe both these leaves and the sky behind it with the same word. This is also true in Chinese, Korean, Pashto, Welsh, and Zulu. Or they might have separate words, but distinguish them differently. In Japan, this traffic light, blue. And a classical Arab poet might call this clear sky, green. In English, both of these colors are blue, but in Russian, they're the separate colors Goloboy and Sini, a distinction between light and dark blue. And plenty of scholars think that the ancient Greeks didn't even have a word for blue. If you read Homer, he often describes the sea as wine dark, and the sky as bronze. Okay, point to you, Frank Miller. But why do English speakers call blue, blue? The English blue comes from the Old French bleu, which itself comes from the Proto-Germanic bleuas, going back to the Proto-Indo-European word bleuas, which meant light-colored, and thus both blue and yellow. And we think that word has its roots in the Proto-Indo-European word bell, meaning shine, or flash, or bright. Bell's meaning of bright is also the root word of many different forms of white. Blanc in French, Blanco in Spanish, Ban in Irish, Bialy in Polish, and Bili in Russian. And also, strangely, black in English. There, the meaning of shine, flash, bright was probably interpreted as the color of burned things. Bell is also the root of many other English words dealing with brightness. A bright fire, blaze, bright hair, blonde, a bright head, bald. The act of making something brighter, bleach. And bell is also the root of a word that means the thing you see after the brightest flash possible. And that word 
is the reason this movie was made. My vision will never come back. The retina is destroyed. Though when the bleeding stops, what is left of my sight might improve. I have to come to terms with sightlessness. Director Derek Jarman made this movie in 1993, as he was dying from AIDS. His retinas were detaching, and he was going... blind. The Gautama Buddha instructs me to walk away from illness. But he wasn't attached to a drip. Jarman had been directing movies for about two decades when he was diagnosed HIV positive in 1986. So when this movie came out, he had been living with AIDS for about seven years. I shall not win the battle against the virus. In spite of the slogans like, living with AIDS. Complications from the disease caused him to temporarily lose his eyesight. During that time, he kept a diary, which formed the skeleton of the script. The meat of the script was provided by Chroma, a book Jarman wrote as sort of a free association thought experiment about what different colors meant to him, which made up many of the symbolic passages where Tilda Swinton monologues about astronauts and stuff. To be an astronaut of the void, leave the comfortable house that imprisons you with reassurance. Remember, to be going and to have are not eternal. And this movie's blueprints this movie's plans had been quite long in the making. Jarman first got the idea of a single color movie back in the 70s when he first saw this painting by the French artist Yves Klein. And it's a single shade of blue. It's a pretty blue. It's the sort of modern art shenanigans that would cause Strawman A to yell, my kid could do that, and cause Strawman B to yell, well, your kid didn't think of it first. And actually, they would be both wrong. Klein didn't think of it first. Uh, the Russian suprematist movement experimented with the beauty of solid color and simple geometric shapes 50 years before Klein made his mark. And your kid actually could not do that. Because your kid can't invent colors. This guy did. Klein developed this color with the chemical firm Rhone Poulenc with the intent of having a liquid paint with the same color intensity as a dry pigment. In 1961, he patented the result. International Klein Blue, or IKB for short. A beautifully rich, deep, bright, almost supernaturally blue color. And he did all kinds of stuff with it. He painted canvases, he painted statues of naked bodies, he painted actual naked bodies, he painted canvases with painted naked bodies. For Klein, IKB was his way of expressing something infinite. The color of the sea and sky, for pretty much every reason that I listed in the first half of this video. IKB was something he described as the colored space that cannot be seen, but which we impregnate ourselves with. And before you start dismissing this whole thing, keep in mind that in 2014, we are totally spoiled for color. I have the edge over nearly every artist in history just because I can open up Photoshop, punch in a hex value of 002FA7, and get a nice, even field of perfect IKB. But as I said before, blue was a very expensive color for most of art history, and so this kind of abundant, unearthly, infinite blue was impossible for thousands of years of human existence. Reach back in time, nab one of your ancestors, and show them this painting, and, well, how could they not be amazed? For both Klein and Jarman, blue was a way into infinity. In the pandemonium of image, I present you with the universal blue. Blue, an open door to soul. An infinite possibility becoming tangible. And in that possibility, he lets his thoughts run wild. And the resulting audio piece jumps from idea to idea, from descriptions of boring doctor's appointments. Here I am again in the waiting room. Hell on Earth is a waiting room. To, uh, more vivid, surrealist flights of fancy. I've walked behind the sky. To... This. I am a cock, sucking straight, acting lesbian man. He is a cock, sucking straight, acting lesbian man. 
the rejected original lyrics to Come On Eileen. The result is that Blue is less of a movie than it is a spoken word concept album. And sure enough, you can get this movie both as a DVD and as a CD soundtrack. But ironically, not on Blu-ray. Pause for laughter. I know what you're thinking. So if you want to express something in an audio-only format, why not just make a radio show? So just as an example, let's look at one of the most popular radio shows on right now. Fine, it's a podcast. It's splitting hairs. Part of the genius of Welcome to Night Vale is how deftly it uses an audio-only medium to call attention to things that can be expressed through language, but not through image. Night Vale has very, very few well-defined visual aspects. Sure, it has some specific imagery, like we know that Hiram McDaniels is literally a five-headed dragon, and that the Apache Tracker is definitely a white guy wearing a very offensive Native American headdress. What an asshole. But so many of its characters are defined in impossibly vague terms. From the man in the tan jacket, to the faceless old woman who secretly lives in your house, to the angels who clearly run the town but officially do not exist, to Kevin whose smile is... No, that is not a smile. Its protagonist and narrator, Cecil Palmer, is officially described as not tall, not short, not thin or fat. Ignore the tall, thin, tattooed, purple-clad white guy with a Buddhist third eye and all that fan art. Cecil Palmer looks like absolutely nothing. By the way, this is my Cecil Palmer cosplay. What? Prove that it can't be! Night Vale is using the most visual medium to call attention to things which cannot be visualized. Everything canon about Night Vale, from the podcast itself, to the live shows, to the Twitter feed, tap dances around the idea of any set image for the show, for purposes of weirdness and comedy and bone-chilling horror and all that. Remember, if you see something, say nothing. But the imagery of Blue isn't ambiguous at all. Say for one minor conceptual digression where the character Blue witnesses the archaeology of sound. Blue watched as a word or phrase materialized in scintillating sparks, a poetry of fire which cast everything into darkness with the brightness of its reflections. So they're... quote mining? But generally, Blue describes fairly straightforward scenes of hospital rooms, his own home, a couple of bits by an ocean, a rave, nothing you couldn't easily film. And even Jarman shown in a flair for the abstract that he could probably have created imagery for the obscure stuff. The difference between Night Vale and Blue is that Night Vale dances around images, while Blue openly rejects them. It forces you to not see. For accustomed to believing in image, an absolute idea of value, his world had forgotten the command of essence. Thou shalt not create unto thyself any graven image. That sentiment is called aniconism, from the Greek without image, the belief in avoiding or rejecting representational art. Lots of religions have aspects of this belief, though its strictest and most famous use is in Islam, whose most devout sects forbid the depiction of any living being of any kind in its art. The logic being, and forgive me if I screw this up, um, to make a piece of art that resembled part of God's creation would diminish God's creation by making something finite out of something infinite. Therefore, in Islamic art, you can see no humans, no animals, no plants, only beautiful shapes and patterns. And in seeing nothing, you are therefore seeing everything. And that's actually an idea supported by psychology. It's called the Gansfeld effect. If a normal human eye looks long enough at an unchanging field of vision with a single monochrome color, like in, say, an Arctic snowstorm or a sensory deprivation tank, that eye will stop sending signals to the brain and may even start hallucinating to fill in the missing visual data. And so imagine seeing this in a theater, cut off from the world, nothing but a big blue screen in front of you, and because you're shown nothing, therefore, you see everything. 
Blue is one of Jarman's cleverest and most risky visual ideas, and it asks a lot of the audience. Yes, he was going blind, but he's not really crying out, Oh, pity this poor soul who lost his sight. Oh, this is my world, come see how I view the world. Because, frankly, that would be too easy. Instead, it's more what he wants to see. How he wants to see. Jarman is choosing to dismantle the use of image and see the infinite in that dismantling. He's no stranger to chaos. Look at these images from The Last of England. Grainy, handheld, color-graded past realism, the image only barely serves as a representation of reality. And as he lays dying, he chooses to abandon the chaos of image and embrace the infinite. Or maybe he's in life, pondering afterlife, and everything he'll experience there. Forgive my wording, but this is, quite literally, a blue screen of death. Love is life that lasts forever. My heart's memory turns to you. David. Howard. Graham. Terry. Paul. These are names of lovers he's lost to the disease. The specter of plague lingers throughout the film, and this remains one of the most unique and most powerful works of art made in response to the AIDS crisis. But even as the fight against AIDS gains strength and the diagnosis stops being a death sentence, it will still resonate as a hymn for the dead and a meditation on the afterlife. I place the Delphinia blue upon your grave. It's one of the most successful cinematic gambles I've ever seen, paid off a thousand times over. But yes, it's a movie that refuses to be a movie. But then again... I like the notion of being forced to rethink what a movie can be. There are more ways to express an idea than a series of images flashed before you at 24 frames a second. All art, all media, has limits, even movies. And this movie is a beautiful reminder of what the medium can and cannot do. Because sometimes, a thousand words can never possibly be worth one picture. Thank <laughs> you.